And then finally, and we have these two books at the back. The last one, however, is not yet here. It's just been printed in Malaysia. It's on the Jasad. You know the Jasad? Oh, look at them. They're shaking their heads. That's good. You're listening to me. <laughs> yes. Uh, the Quran, the Jal, and the Jasad, which is just a little bigger. Yeah. And uh, it'll probably take maybe two or three months to get to, to Britain, inshallah. Um, I can't get a bookshop. I can't get a bookshop to sell my books. <laughs> so you have to go to my online bookstore to order it, Imran Hussein. Uh, C-O-M, until we can get bookshops, bookshops to be prepared to sell my books. Uh, Ashad, are you ready now? You are? Okay. Nahmaduhu wa nusalli ala rasulihi al-kareem. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all, the Blessed Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam. We thank uh, Imam Khurram and uh, the management committee of this masjid for their kind invitation to me to speak once more. I think I've been here once before. Uh, on the subject of the strategic importance of the fast of Ramadan, which incidentally is also the topic of one of my little books at the back, the strategic importance of the fast of Ramadan. And we begin with the blessed Quran. The Ramadan is the month in which the Qur'an was sent down. Hudan linnas That in this book there is guidance. So if you neglect this book, you will be misguided. If you do not turn to this book to study, for example, what is money, you're going to be taken for a ride. And at the end of the day, you will have only yourself to blame for having neglected the book which Allah sent as guidance. وَبَيِّنَاتٍ مِّنَ الْهُدَىٰ It comes with the evidence and the proof that it is indeed guidance. وَالْفُرْقَانِ And it is this book which separates truth from falsehood. It is with this book that you must therefore go out into the world. Don't leave the book behind. As you attempt to separate truth from falsehood in the world. Separate light from darkness. Separate guidance from misguidance. It is with this book. And then Allah says, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمْ بُشَّهْرَ فَلْيَسُمْ إِلَىٰ آخِرِ الْآيَةِ And tonight we ask, Two questions, that's all, so you can't forget it. The first question is, if the whole Quran came down in the month of Ramadan, then this ayah also came down in the month of Ramadan. So then why for 13 years in Mecca, Jibra'il alayhi salam was never instructed to bring it to Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu salam. We never fasted Ramadan in Mecca. Is that a pertinent question? Is that a relevant question? Is that an important question? Have you ever asked that question? 
Nothing in this book happens by accident. Only a schoolboy will treat the book like that. But anyone who is gifted with the capacity to think, well, I have news for you. Most people today, because of the smartphone, no longer smart. They can't think anymore. They don't have time to think anymore. So I don't have any time for them. <laughs> My time is for those who still have the capacity to think and who do not want to disrespect what Allah gave to them, the capacity to think. I, I have joy in my heart when I meet someone who thinks. So for 13 years, Allah never sent it down from the Sama al-Dunya to Nabi Muhammad And tonight we ask, why? And then we make the hijrah from this city to that one in the north, which we know at that time was Yathrib. Yathrib. Subsequently, we decided to give it the name Medina. But when we arrived in Medina, still, for 17 months, we never heard فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَسُ So whosoever claims to witness the month of Ramadan, you must fast. And the question we ask tonight here in Ilfal is why are we kept waiting 13 years in Mecca? 17 months in Marina. Why? What is Allah waiting for? It is the month of Shaban. It is the second Shaban that we are experiencing in this new city of Yatrib, now called Medina. And it is at this time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses to act and to do a number of things of absolutely strategic importance for the rest of mankind, for history. In Yatrib, there was a large and influential community of Israelite people. But <laughs> they were called Israelites, Banu Israel, prior to when the Messiah was sent to them. And when some of them saw him crucified before their very eyes, they saw it. Because Allah says, Allah made it appear like that to them. Allah made it appear to them like that. Do I need to repeat it more? Some of them wept. They cried. Because they believed in him as the Messiah. But others celebrated. You can't put me in jail for saying that. Because you will have to put the Quran in jail. They don't dare to put the Quran in prison, do they? Wakawli <laughs> him. They're boasting. Inna katalna al-Masiha Isa ibn Maryam Rasulullah. It's sarcasm as well. They're boasting. So these are weeping and these are celebrating. It is then that they were all expelled from the Holy Land. But now Allah chooses to name these differently and name these differently. Now these are called Al-Yahud and these are called Al-Nasara. 
And Allah punishes these by breaking them up into bits and pieces and scattering them all over the world. وَقَطَعَنَاهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مُمَمْ And they are not permitted to return to Jerusalem to recover it as their own. وَحَرَامٌ عَلَى قَرْيَةٍ أَهْلَكْنَاهَا أَنَّهُمْ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ they're not permitted to return. But this other one, the one who wept, Allah favored them. And if you want to know how Allah favored them, read my book, Constantinople, in the Quran. So who are these here in Medina, in Yathrib? That group, not this one. This one. The ones who rejected him. The ones who celebrated when they saw him crucified before their very eyes because Allah made it appear like that. So, Allah sends his last messenger. No more after this. This is your last chance. And he arrives in Medina. And the most pivotally important moment in their history has arrived. If they believe in him and they follow him, Allah is not saying this to those who wept. This part, this part. If you believe him and you follow him and you help him and you assist him, then Allah asa rabbukum an yarhamakum. Yes. So then Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam on arriving in Medina, I will use the term Medina now, he performed his salat in the direction of Jerusalem. No Arab ever did that. They worship idols made of wood and stone, but they always turn to Mecca. Here was evidence as dazzling as the sunshine. This must indeed be a prophet of the Lord God. Because no Arab would do that. He turned in the direction of our Qibla, Jerusalem. And he's praying like that. And all his followers, whether they like it or they don't, they do it. They turn in the direction of Jerusalem. But he did something more than that. He began to fast with them on the days when they fasted. And in accordance with their law of fasting, which is also his law of fasting. It's the Sharia, which was still in force. And what was that Sharia? You will fast from, dawn, from sunset to sunset. Hmm? On this first days of the year. And so for 17 months we fasted like that. And here was evidence as dazzling as the sunshine. That this man is indeed a true prophet of the Lord God. But no, they could not accept him. If he is an Arab and we accept him as a prophet, the implication would be that our book is filled with lies. And we cannot accept that our book, the Torah, is filled with lies. So they rejected him. But they did more than that. After 17 months in Medina, they were now conspiring to destroy him and to destroy the community which followed him. Allah was waiting for that moment. Waiting for that moment. And when that moment arrived, he shut the door to them. Before that moment arrived, we belong to one Ummah. Al Yahud, Al Nasara, and us. We belong to one Ummah. 
But when that moment arrived, and Allah shut the door, this is a turning point in history. He changed the Qibla. And when he changed the Qibla, he created a new Ummah. And he gave to this Ummah a mission. And you'd cry tonight. The tears will fall from your eyes when the evidence is presented that we have betrayed that mission. Yes. And there will be those who will have to answer on Judgment Day more than just the ordinary people. The scholars of Islam, the politicians, oh, they'll have a lot to answer for having betrayed that mission. Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas. I didn't create you. I didn't bring you out as just an ordinary ummah. No. I brought you out to become the best. And what will make you the best? Ta'muruna bil ma'roof. If it is right. Stand up for it, regardless of whether you're going to lose your green card or they're going to call you a terrorist or they're going to put you on a no-fly list or your business is going to suffer. If it is right, stand up for it. That's your mission. And if it is wrong, if it is unjust, if it is evil, stand up against it, regardless of your price that you have to pay. When a man talks like this, they say, could you send this man back home? <laughs> that is the betrayal. That is the betrayal. By those, you'll have to excuse my language, the Tom, Dick and Harry, who take control of our communities. And they become the arbiters, who will speak and who will not speak. And so they close the doors of the masjid to you when you speak like that. But I have a message for them. He doesn't sleep. And if you close one masjid, he can open another one. وَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ And when you perform this mission for mankind, for standing up but for what is right and just and standing up against the oppressor and you do it with faith in Allah then you become the best ummah so he changed the Qibla and he created a new ummah and this is Shaban not yet Ramadan and he did something else in that Shaban. What did he do? He sent down. <laughs> he sent down the revelation. فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمْ فَلْيَسُمْ It is at this moment that he sent down the revelation. At this moment he told us, next month will be Ramadan. And you will fast for that Ramadan that's coming. Now the question is why? Have you ever asked that question why? What is the relationship between Ramadan and the birth of a new Ummah? And what is the relationship between the Quran which was sent down in Ramadan and the birth of a new Ummah? The answer is, let me give it up front. That this Ummah, if it is to survive as an Ummah, meaning as an independent Ummah, and not that you would be absorbed into the global melting pot that is a godless melting pot 
a one world community and every Muslim become like cattle as a part of that global community and you lose your identity as Muslims. You're just a part. I call it the blue jeans, Jamaat. They all wear blue jeans. <laughs> Even in the masjid they wear blue jeans. Even on the member you might see blue jeans. I'm not seeking to hurt the feelings of anyone. Just a little bit of amusement. <laughs> if this ummah is to remain with its integrity intact, in order to be able to full its, fulfill its mission, then, number one, the fast of Ramadan is supposed to play a critically important role in calling you back to Allah. And so every single one of you here present now have to go back out there. And all the members of your family, all your friends, all the neighbors and so on, Work energetically to bring them back. The sheep are straying. Bring them back. Which is why I don't like iftar in the masjid. Now, yes, maybe you could take a date or two, a glass of water, but go back home. And have your dinner, your iftar with your family. Yes. The, the children must keep the memories for years and years and years. This is how we had Ramadan. That we fasted for the whole day. And then after the Salatul Maghrib, Papa, Mama, Dada, Abba, Daddy, Ami, Nani, Ami, all of us would sit down and we would eat. And it is such a joyous occasion. This is bringing the sheep back. This is bringing the sheep back into the fold. Because the sheep are straying. This is the time to cause our people to make toba for what they had done during the year. For all the neglect and negligence during the year. Come back, come back, come back to the deen. Come back to Allah, come back to the masjid. And every one of you have to join in that effort. But there is more to it than that. When we fast, we stay away from food and drink. So this lady in Manhattan, she works in Manhattan and she took the Shahada just before Ramadan. So now she's a Muslim, she has to fast. She forgot to tell the people who send lunch every day that don't send lunch for me in Ramadan. So on the first day of fasting, she's fasting. She's feeling the hunger. Knock, 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 the lunch arrives. It's delicious lunch. And she's hungry. What to do? She's looking at the lunch. She's accustomed to eating every day. The first day she's fasting. And then she shook her head. The door is closed. The window is closed. Nobody is seeing. I can eat if I want. But Allah is watching. I can't eat. This is what Ramadan does. When you fast, you turn away from food and drink. Allah is saying, you're doing it for me. And therefore, if you can fast for me, why can't you live for me? Living for Allah means Allah is in the heart. <coughs> Living for Allah means Allah is in the heart. Living for Allah means that Allah is in the heart. But Allah is not going to be impressed. Oh, you have me in your heart, but not over the Quran. Oh, the Quran is over there on the shelf. And I pick up the Quran now and then, you know, after dinner. That is not having Allah in your heart. 
If you have a lie in your heart, you'll have the Quran in your heart. If you have a lie in your heart, you'll have the Quran in your heart. Yes. And this is why Allah chose the month of Ramadan for the fast, not the month of Shaban, not the month of Rajab. It was not by accident. The month of Ramadan was chosen for fasting because it is the month in which the Quran was revealed. So as you fast in the month of Ramadan, Allah is calling you back to the Quran. And that is why he gave you the Salat to Taraweeh. Now tell me, is it possible that you come to the Masjid and you perform Salat to Taraweeh a night after night for one whole month and you never cried? Is it possible? Kabinai? Not possible? Impossible? How can a Muslim perform Salat to Taraweeh for the whole month listening to the Quran which is recited So you will choose the one who has the most beautiful voice Choose that one to lead the Salat of Taraweeh. And he will recite the Quran beautifully. Not 95 miles an hour. And you'll have to call the police for him. Eh? Which is an act of disrespect to the Quran. Whichever Darulum trained him like that should be shut down. No, no, no. He's going to recite the Quran Beautifully, and he has a beautiful voice. And you are listening to the Quran every night, and there will come moments when the Quran will break your heart, and you will start crying, and the one next to you will just feel your body shaking. But is that possible? If a uh, after the salat, somebody asks you, what did the imam recite? And you say, I don't know, but it was a nice tune. Hmm? I don't know what he said, but it was a nice tune. It was a nice tune. Huh? Will you cry? No, you'll cry if you can understand. And if you've just entered into Islam, you've just taken the shahada, yes, we excuse you. But if all your life you've never made the effort to understand the Quran as you recite it, my gosh, you have disrespected the book of Allah and you're going to pay a price for that. Yes, and the fast of Ramadan can do nothing for you really, no? When you listen to the Qur'an being recited every night of Salat al-Tarawih, that's not the only contact with the Qur'an in Ramadan. Something happened in Ramadan, every Ramadan, after this revelation came down. What was it? The most important sunnah of Ramadan is that Jibra'il alayhi salam was sent every night of Ramadan. And Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam would have to recite the Quran from cover to cover as much as was revealed. Recitation is not with the eyes. This is reading. Recitation is with the tongue. The tongue must move in order for the angel to record. And so it is the sunnah, divinely ordained, that we have to recite the whole Quran from cover to cover in Ramadan. I know many of you do that, but if you have not done that, 
then you better wake up. Because you are abandoning the most important sunnah of the month of Ramadan. To recite the whole Quran from cover to cover. A man came to the Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam and said, O Messenger of Allah, we have to recite the Quran. How long should we take? Meaning from cover to cover. But Allah has said in the Quran, He said, recite what is easy for you. So Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam has to give an answer which is in conformity with the Quran. Listen carefully to this hadith before the angel comes to take you. Even young people can go, you know. Even young people can go. Listen carefully before it's too late. If you have been neglecting the Quran, I'm not pointing to anybody. I don't know you. <laughs> the, the Prophet ﷺ replied and said, Recite the whole Quran cover to cover once a month. Meaning once a lunar month. The Imam cannot come in front of you and tell you to do that if he's not himself doing it. Imran cannot come to you in front of you tonight and ask you to do that if Imran is not doing it himself. Recite the whole Quran from cover to cover once a month. The man said, O Messenger of Allah, I'm young, I'm strong, I can do better than that. I am 77 years of age, I know what old age is like, it's difficult for me to complete the Quran twice in a month. Yes, it's difficult for me. But he said, I'm young, I'm strong, I can do better than that. So then the Prophet said, okay, recite the whole Quran once every 10 days. So three times to the month. The man said, oh, messenger of Allah, I'm young, I'm strong, I can do better than that. You think anybody could do that today with this smartphone? which occupies it. I see them on the road walking and they're not looking where they're walking, they're walking with this smartphone. Yes, you won't believe me. Yes, everywhere you see this smartphone, you go in the doctor's office, everybody's sitting along with this smartphone. And I say to myself, my gosh, Dajjal is certainly successful. Dajjal is certainly successful. I don't have a smartphone and I'm still functioning and I'm probably doing better than most of you in how I utilize my time. Yes. So he said, okay, then recite the whole Quran once a week, but not faster than that. Because if you recite faster than that, you'd not be able to absorb the meaning. So you cannot recite the Qur'an mechanically. You have to recite the Qur'an to be able to understand what you're reciting. And if you're not doing that as yet, stop where you are and get to work. Get to work. Now then, for the most important part of this lecture. A new Ummah is born. And this Ummah has a pivotally important important role to play in the end of history but the Prime Minister of Pakistan does not know that because they don't teach it in Oxford. Now, that does not mean that I'm disrespecting the government of Pakistan. It's just by recognizing that they don't have a single person, not one, in the cabinet, not one in the heads of the armed forces who have even a passing acquaintance with the Quran. And yet you, call, you call yourself the Islamic Republic of Pakistan. That's why I have to call them today the Islamic Republic of Shushine boys of us. It's Muhammad bin Salman, the one who gave the order to murder Adnan Khashoggi. The CIA tells many lies, but the CIA said the truth. He said he's the one who ordered it. 
He is the one who ordered it. If we are to fulfill our mission as an Ummah and not be absorbed into this global godless melting pot, one world community with one world government, and lose our identity and lose our capacity to function as an independent Ummah, then Allah is saying it is the Quran and it is Ramadan which will have to help you to preserve your independence. How does it do it? How does it do it? Well, first of all, Allah is saying to you every day of Ramadan. If you can fast for me, why can't you live for me? If you can fast for me, you turn away from the food because of me. You turn away from the drink because of me. You turn away from your wives because of me. If you can fast for me, why can't you live for me? Why do you live for your business? Why do you live for your green card or your passport? Why do you live for your, that your name should not be on a nose file? Who do you worship? Are you worshipping me or are you worshipping your business? Will you not have sincerity in your heart for once and put me as the supreme being, that your supreme loyalty is to me and to nothing else? If you can fast for me, why can't you live for me? Why is it important that we must live for Allah? And this is what he says in the Quran. Kulinna salati wa nusuki wa mahiyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen. Tell them, tell them, proclaim it. Verily my prayer and my service of sacrifice, sacrifice and my very living and my very dying, all, 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 subcoach, everything is for you. My primary loyalty is to you. And if I have to stand up for the truth and pay this price or that price, I don't mind the price. No. But I must be faithful to you. If you can do that, now you can preserve this ummah. Those who led the Muslims of India when the British were leaving were men who knew Islam and who lived Islam. You don't know that. You're too young to know that. There were men who knew Islam and who lived Islam. And they established the Khilafat movement. Yes, the Khilafat movement had its weaknesses. You don't have to tell me, I know the subject. But at least they were trying to be faithful to Allah. And it was only when the Khilafat movement had been destroyed that the All India Muslim League had a chance to come over. And who led the All India Muslim League? It is an absolutely correct statement to say that there were men who neither knew Islam nor lived Islam the way these were well, previously people were, but they knew Islam and they lived Islam. And so you got what you got. But when the Great War takes place, they're going to attack Pakistan. And at that time, I want to know if you raise your hands in dua after you've gone to the IMF for another loan and Allah has said he's going to wage war on you and his messenger is going to wage war on you. And I send the message to Islamabad, but they didn't listen to me. Will Allah accept your dua when you're betraying him? And we has, he has said in the Quran he's going to wage war on you. Maybe after that that the Muslims of India and Pakistan and Bangladesh may be able to pick up the pieces and return to the Khilafat movement in a struggle to bring back the Khilafat state that Allah wants. Now then, those who live for Allah would be a people who would, be, who would study the Qur'an and who would live the Qur'an. And in the process of establishing this bond with the Qur'an, this is the most important part of my lecture tonight. 
You get more than knowledge. Yes. You get something called insight. You get the capacity to see with the nur of Allah. Because the angel asked, what is Islam? And he gave the answer. Then the angel asked, what is Iman? And he gave the answer. And then when the angel asked, what is Ihsan? So there is a stage of the deen above Islam and Iman. And he replied and he said, That you should worship Allah as though you are seeing him, but you can't see him with these eyes. So it is to worship Allah with the internal eye. Spirituality, ruhaniyat, is to be able to see with the internal eye. And if you have the internal eye, if you can see with the nur of Allah, you'll be able to understand the world today. We, we want the Imam who stands on the mimbar to explain to the people the reality of the world today. You think Brexit affects only Britain? No. Brexit is only preparing the rest of the world. Brexit is part of the opening round for something much bigger than that. And this function of the followers of Nabi Muhammad who are here in Britain is to teach and educate the British people, to explain to them what is happening. Because you have the Qur'an, they don't have it. If you are not doing that, then you are betraying the Qur'an. If you are not doing that, you have eyes and yet cannot see. You are producing only schoolboys, you are not producing scholars. They want to establish one world government. And all of mankind will be ruled by that one government. And that one world government will be located in Jerusalem. They want to create one world currency, one currency. And that's why they have cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, so that they can destabilize and cause the collapse of the national currencies to prepare the way for the one world currency and one central bank which will control that one world currency from Jerusalem. But you already know all of this because I have been teaching it for a long, long time. But who else is teaching it? The Brexit is like that. They have to bring down sovereignty, state sovereignty has to be whittled down, destabilized. And when state sovereignty is gone, then you can have one world government. They used to have the Pakistan cricket team and the Australian cricket team and the British and the West Indies. I am from the West Indies. Everybody, I'm from Brian Lara's country. And then suddenly we're hearing about red socks and blue socks and what nonsense is this? We never heard about the cricket teams. We know about the West Indies cricket team. Well, no, they have to bring down the national identity, whittle it down. You forget your nationality to prepare yourself to be a citizen of the world government. And so Brexit is the beginning round. Is Britain going to struggle to pre preserve its independence, preserve its sovereignty, even if it has to eat dal and roti? Or is Britain going to give up its sovereignty so it could eat turkey and lamb? That's what Euro, the Euros are offering you, the European community. If you stay with us, it's material prosperity. 
And if you separate from us, you eat dal and roti. And guess what Britain is going to choose eventually? No, we don't want dal and roti. <laughs> we'll give up our sovereignty so we can eat murgi. So, is the Ummah of Muhammad also going to betray the Ummah this way? And give up our identity? Answer, we've already given it up. Oh yeah, khatam. <laughs> we've already given it up. And it is the scholars of Islam who love to answer on Judgment Day. What we have to do now is to try to recover it. I have spoken enough to explain to you what is happening in the world today. And the fast of Ramadan is meant to give you eyes with which to see and give you backbone with which to stand. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may bless those who now return to the Quran, to study the Quran, that the Quran might guide us and explain to us the world in which we live today. We don't have much time left before the Azan. It's a quarter to? Quarter to. Uh, but after the Salatul Isha, inshallah, uh, if the Imam permits it, we can have a question and answer session. I, I want to end by reminding you that we fasted with them for 17 months. The evidence is there in the Quran. We were not supposed to go to our wives during the night while fasting. No? But then Allah sent down revelation and He said, Ohilla lakum laylat as rafasu ila nisa'ikum. And we were smiling now, we were happy. We now have permission to go to our wives during the fast. nights of fasting. But Allah went on to say something else. And that caused us to feel a little bit embarrassed. He said, Alim Allahu annakum kuntum takhtanuna anfusakum. I know what you used to be doing in the night time when you're supposed to be staying away from them. Secretly, you used to be going to them. Alim Allahu annakum kuntum takhtanuna anfusakum. Fatabu alaykum wa afaankum. Allah says, I've turned, I've. I've Forgiven you for what you've done. Turn towards you mercifully and forgiven you. For And so we were a part of that ummah. And we were fasting in accordance with that law. And we were paying in, praying in the, in the direction of that Qibla. And here is the evidence now that it was in that month of Shaban that Allah created a new Ummah, gave us a new Qibla. That Qibla is still valid for them. That's what the Quran says. They must follow their Qibla. And we must follow our Qibla. We must not follow each other's Qibla. And then Allah gave us a new law of fasting and the old law of fasting is still valid for them. Yes. And we have a new law of fasting. And I believe that it was about this time. But I have not been able to find the evidence yet to provide it. That it was about this time, in that same month of Shaban, that Allah sent down permission allowing us to fight. Because the next month is Ramadan and the next month is Badr. The next month is Badr. So maybe that the revelation came down in Shaban, not in Ramadan, but I don't know. But there's not much difference between Shaban and Ramadan. So this is a very, very, very important moment. When he sends down, Kutiba alaykumul kital, you are now obliged to fight. So Allah is giving you the means to preserve your identity. Preserve the integrity of this Ummah, not only with a new Qibla, 
not only with the new law of fasting, but also with the obligation to fight. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may grant that this Ramadan might be the Ramadan where we, in which we will return to the Quran. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka inta samil alim wa tawa alayna ya mulana inna ka inta tawab rahim. Barahmatika ya arhamar rahmin. Ameen. I am saying 45 and this is saying 48. Okay. Shall we have a question and answer afterwards? Okay. So after the salat, inshallah, you can have a few minutes for question and answer.